Good evening, folks. Hope everybody's had a good week. We still got a couple minutes. We'll go ahead and let people uh, filter in. Just another minute or two and then we'll get started. It's been very crazy here the last couple of days. Lots of bad weather. And, oh, just all kinds of stuff. So I hope you guys are safe and, and are not experiencing what I've been going through for the last couple of days. All right. Just another minute or two and then we'll get started because it's not even 7 o'clock yet. Hope everybody's been productive as much as possible with this going on. All right. All right. It is seven o'clock tonight. We're not drinking any seven up or seven up in Seagrams. We're out of Seagrams. Hello, Zyta or Zyla. Hope I'm saying that right. And hello to everybody else. Um, tonight we are dealing with uh, Druid School lesson number six, and this is the big one. Uh, well, one of the big ones. There's others that'll be coming down the line that are just as important but this is the one that I always get from people that are new to Druidry and they always they're always asking um, you know what about altars and some of the other things we're gonna talk about altars indoor and out we're gonna talk about the differences in various sacred spaces we're gonna talk about some of the uh, clothing and accoutrement that are worn by uh, various druids and, and even in various druid orders in the United States and around the world so we've got a lot of that to cover and then we have just it's it's gonna be cool this is one of the things because uh, everybody is so uh, wrapped up in I think one of the things that kind of brings people into paganism is the idea that you can you get to be creative like how you build your altar and do these other things but uh, you know that's that's just one perk of it and then I think you know a lot of people have seen the way things are, are you know dramatized and stuff in, in you know movies like the craft and so on and so forth so that's one of the things that uh, you know that that always interests people is that they can do this and the thing about it is is really it's not just about having a nice table full of pretty stuff um, it's been said that a magician or a pagan is supposed to be able to do magic at the drop of a hat and that we really shouldn't need um, anything because you know we shouldn't need anything to uh, you know act as triggers and things like that for various magical operations and stuff we should just be able to do it with ourselves and our mind and that's true that is very true but on the other side of that you also have to look at a person's developmental ability, um, a development and ability. Um, you know, some people in early stages of learning about what paganism is and stuff like that, they're not necessarily going to be able to uh, work like that. You know, it's like they're so new that you have to show them. And one of the ways that you show somebody something is you give them visual cues and, uh, and other Vision, like sight, sound, smell, the things that, that uh, arouse our five senses. So um, one of the ways that we do that is through establishing a ritual atmosphere. And some of the ways that we establish a ritual atmosphere are by wearing our ritual, ritual robes and other gear. 
and also setting up sacred space and having an altar. And uh, basically, um, the altar is like a uh, energy connection station. It's where you plug yourself in to the earth, nature, the divine, the gods, and it's a conduit between you and them and through various ritual procedures, uh, movements, chants, different things during your, your, your work or your celebration that these connections are made. And that's why uh, I encourage people that are new to figure out their, you know, their situation of what path they're on. And then they, they should immediately kind of start looking into uh, what are some of the things that these, that these different paths do for their uh, setup and, and styles of altars. Um, and, and just to go from there as far as, uh, I look at it this way. A simple altar can be just as effective as one that is loaded to the gills with so many things that there's no space to move on it. You know, you can have it, you can have it with just one candle that'll work on an altar, or you can have candles, bells, uh, uh, statuary, the whole nine yards. It just depends on how comfortable you are um, as far as, you know, whenever you work. And we're also going to be talking about indoor sacred spaces and outdoor sacred spaces, what they are, and why we do them. Also, um, tonight, while we're talking about this, uh, I encourage you, if you have any questions or whatever, just pop them up here on the side, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, uh, just to start out, one of, the th one of the things that I always recommend for people that are new is don't go overboard and keep things simple to start, because... One thing that I I was uh, you know I went through this myself years ago whenever I very first got into you know pagan traditions you know witchcraft and so forth was I spent a lot of money and I went through every occult bookstore and shop and stuff that I could get my hands on and kind of spent more money than I needed to when you can simply go to various uh, secondhand shops. Um, and places in town in your town that you know have uh, you know old vintage things and stuff. I don't necessarily buy a lot of new. The only thing that I do get new is new incense whenever I'm not making it, or candles whenever I don't make candles because I do make incense, I do make candles, and on certain occasions I'm not too bad at it, but I do make ritual oils. So those are some things that you can always do for yourself. But other things, it's like don't. You know, don't go spending, uh, you know, for those that practice witchcraft, you don't have to go spending, uh, uh, you know, five or $600 for a fancy athame when you can buy a knife blank and a handle for under uh, under 100 bucks, And with a little time and, and effort, you can make an effective magical tool. And the other thing is, like, I'll also, for anything that you that you do for your altar, if you can make it, even better because of the fact that the tool that you're using um, is going to be a lot more effective than something that you uh, took money and purchased. Um, you know, you can you, you get a lot better mileage magically and and you know connect connectively um, than you would by you know going out and spending. I mean, I know people that have gone and you know at the very beginning and have gone out and you know like I'm you know into gardenerian witchcraft so they look up what the gardenerian altar looks like and they go and they buy all these different things and they spend upwards of five six seven hundred dollars and that's great if you know I can't I can't you know go against them because they spent all that money but on the other side of it you kind of think yeah but you could have had just as great of an altar and have effective as an altar because an altar is a tool it's not just a pretty table but it's a, as effective a tool as it is because that's what an altar is. It's not just a pretty table. It's a tool that you use um, by yourself or with others to make connections to the nature spirits, the ancestors, the gods, and various other things. So by, you know, um, and another thing is like by using it. I know people that will set up an altar and, you know, then they say, well, I'm going to do ritual. 
I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and they don't do it and the reason why they don't do it is because I always get the same thing from that is oh I'm scared I'm afraid that I'll do it wrong you can't magically charge a uh, your, your your altar if you don't use it you're just gonna it's just gonna be something that you're gonna sit across the room and uh, look at and before we get to the outside part of things which we'll deal with that here in just a little bit we're gonna deal with the inside part of things and uh, one thing about altars is like I said keeping them simple but also the other side of that is you don't necessarily have to have a room in your house dedicated to just to having your altar if you do have a bedroom or a back room that isn't being used by all means go ahead and set that up but a corner in a, a dining room uh, a shelf um, on the wall um, you know one of those three tiered uh, shelves that you can buy at one of the uh, uh, you know the all wood stores you know where you finish it yourself you can get that and make that a project where you put it together and finish it and then place various items uh, on your altar um, so you have all these different spaces and places inside your house that you can do it and that's one thing it's like you customize it for you if you want a big table altar go for it if you want just a little a little uh, bedside table a little round bedside table um, that is you know just maybe 18 inches across can be wonderful as an altar the one thing that's good about those the smaller altars is they're easy to assemble they're easy to disassemble and you 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 know you put it together you do what you need to do at the end of the evening you clean things up and put your your other tools and stuff away and it makes it really easy to you know do things that you need to do um, on the other side of it is the for those of us that do have bigger altars I have two altars in my house I have one that's off to the left of me right here and it's basically on top of an old TV stand um, and it's got stuff on it and then my full ritual altar is uh, in a nook here in my dining area and it's large it's an actual um, old wooden um, uh, coffee table it's about five and a half six feet long and then about three two and a half feet wide so it's got some length and depth the reason why I like it and use it is because underneath it it's got doors with hollowed out areas in there where I can put my candles uh, certain books, ritual, uh, other ritual items, and it keeps things away. And then everything that I want to be on the altar at all times are up there at all times with uh, an altar cloth and stuff. And so it's it's set up, and I can change it around for different uh, uh, moon rituals. I can do it for actual mat. I can change it up for magic and stuff but once I get done with it I don't necessarily once I get done with it other than if I'm just doing it like a regular magical working I will take everything off of that and then I put it back the way I had it before because I'm a believer in you know getting the energy up in that altar as much as possible so you keep it you kinda keep it on an even keel now so let's say that you've got your you got yourself a space you got yourself a place to do it and um, you know you've got a table you've got whatever the next thing everybody's gonna ask is okay I've got this space right here what's next well if you're using something like a formica top or wood or anything like that you're eventually going to have uh, the mishaps of spilling things you're either gonna spill uh, powdered incense or you're gonna spill uh, candle wax or something all over the top of it so the main thing that you want to do is find something that you can use for an altar cloth um, and there are places online that have various Celtic designs and things like that or if you have uh, you know uh, old tie-dyed sheets or anything like that that you like the color of anything can be um, an altar cloth. A lot of people have many different altar cloths to use for different situations whether they're doing divination or they're doing a seasonal working or whatever and you can have uh, uh, get one of those uh, sealable boxes 
the the larger ones that will hold like blankets and stuff at, that you can get at Walmart. You know, they're like four or five bucks, and get all your altar cloths of different you know sizes, shapes, and whatever. Fold them up and then put them in there, and then whenever it's time to change your altar around, you just go in there and you get it out and you do that. It saves a lot of trouble because, uh, especially on my altar in the other room there, is if the candles, uh, the wax goes over and stuff, getting the wax out of a wood top um, a lot of time is hard because you don't necessarily want to use, you don't want to be scraping or whatever like that because then that mars the surface and it just doesn't make the, it doesn't make the, you know, the, the top last as long. So, um, you do that. Also, another thing that you can do is if you really want to be protective of your altar is not only do you want to get the, uh, uh, you know, the altar cloth and put it on, but I've known people that have taken the measurement of their altar, whether it's oblong or square or round or whatever, and have gone to uh, a glass cutters and they asked them to cut uh, a piece of glass to the shape of whatever you know their the table or, or altar space that they're using and um, I recommend that too because then you can put the altar you can put the altar cloth down then you can put the piece of glass over the top of it and the reason why you want to do that especially is also because of the simple fact that if you have candles and incense and other liquidy things that are uh, on there if you're doing like a, a black mirror in a bowl of water, these other things you can do. You can ac have accidents that will mess up your altar cloth, and then in turn mess up your altar. So you can do that. The reason why you want to use glass is because if you use plastic or some other material, it will negate what you're trying to do. It's like uh, you want to be as natural. You want to keep your space as natural as possible. So in other words. Um, you know anything that is like you don't want uh, there's some incenses liquid incenses and incenses and stuff that are more chemicals and and smells than actual incense the way it's supposed to be so you don't necessarily want anything uh, on your altar that is unnatural you know you want as much as possible I mean the closest thing that could be considered not natural is your athame or whatever because it's it's smelted ore but the only thing is whenever you look at that that blade is made from rock that comes from the earth so if it's a, a an iron blade with a wooden handle that's as natural as you're gonna get so you just you know you want to be very careful about uh, what you have on there plus another thing is it acts as a chip so that if you do put candles and, and other incense burners and things they get hot and if you put them directly on the table, they can uh, heat rings into the top of your table and stuff like that. So by sticking that layer of glass across the top, it will help kind of diffuse some of the heat through there. And then also, if you do have any uh, missteps or spills or anything like that, then you can wipe it down and then uh, take, after you've wiped it down, uh, you know, take some... Uh, uh, vinegar and uh, a paper towel and spray it down and then clean any residues off and then it'll be ready to go for your next ritual and stuff. So you figured out that you've got the table that you're going to use for your altar. You figured out that you're going to put an altar cloth on there. So next you're going to want to figure out what you will put onto the altar itself. And one of the first things that uh, a lot of people do is they will put candles. And you can make your candles. You can get uh, go to places around your town that people make candles, beeswax, the whole nine yards. Uh, one thing that I recommend is that you keep a supply of many colors, all as many colors as you can get because you never know whenever you're going to be working some kind of ritual or working for the ancestors that a certain color of candle uh, can come in handy. I recommend the little votive candles. I recommend the bigger votive, uh, the bigger pillar candles. Um, 
and then they've got then you've got the longer tapers. Um, one thing is uh, keep them in a cool, dry place because if you keep them in a hot place, they get all bendy and melty, and they look really weird when you put them on your altar. So you can do that. Also, another thing that you can do that will make them burn longer is you can take. Uh, uh, I tend to do this with like with a single color. Is you take a plastic box and you put uh, about an inch and a half of water with a heavy layer of salt in there and kind of swish it around and you put those candles in that salt water and you uh, put them in your refrigerator or if you're gonna do the, if you want to uh, uh, you know make it where they're gonna uh, burn even slower about an, uh, half an hour before a ritual take those uh, candles that are in the box uh, full of water and salt and put it up in the freezer for about 30 minutes. You don't want it to be up there too long or it'll freeze in the ice and then you won't have your candles. But you just want to make that coldness a little bit stronger. And then whenever you get ready to set up your altar for your working, you just take the candle out, wipe it down, and, and you know get it ready for whatever holder that you're going to use. Um, the next thing is I highly recommend, and I'm pulling something over here, I highly recommend in whatever form that you can do it, something, especially those of us that are practicing druidry, is something that you can make uh, an all wind symbol and put it on there. This goes on, uh, I have one like this and I have another one on my other altar. And it's just simple paint and on a wooden disc that um, I got at a uh, supply place here in town. And you can put a little holder behind it to make it stand because that's one of the main things that whenever I'm doing ritual, whether it's for the gods or for the ancestors, um, Embus and Alwyn are the things that I'm always concentrating on to, uh, you know, be able to work and do the things. So I think that's one of the main symbols and things that we want to have uh, on the altar. Um, next, I'm going to do something here real quick just give me a second and this is something that not everybody is going to be able to do but for those of us that um, uh, involve the gods in our ritual uh, depending on what the ritual is that you're doing um, you can have statuary that you have for your altar um, to, you know, represent the gods. There's the Morgan, there's the Dagda, there's one of my favorites right here, which I recently got. This is a beautiful, beautiful statue of Danu. And it's just beautiful, very detailed, um, good weight. It's about nine inches tall. And these you can find uh, online. I got this online. Um, it's made by a reputable seller, and it's a very lovely representation of the Mother Goddess, so that's a very important thing. I haven't necessarily found um, a good representation of Danu, so I also have this stag head, which I use as a representation of the primal male. Then the Dagda is the primal male, um, and he is, uh, you know, a god of nature and the forest and things of his own right. So this is something for now that I am using as a uh, representative of what the primal male energy is. So right there, those are three things that are, for me, most important. Um, the one thing that I don't have which we'll talk about here in a minute, is uh, I don't have a sickle. And the reason why I don't have a sickle for my altar is because um, I had somebody steal mine. There was a ritual that we did here a few years back, and it was an outdoor ritual in somebody's backyard, and I brought everything and set the altar up and everything, and uh, we were getting ready to do it, you know, have, you know, have our ritual. And I had to go into the house and get some other things and bring some food out to put onto the altar. And when I came out, 
everything was set up. There's a couple things that looked a little bit out of place. And when I went to get ready to, you know, do what I needed to do to uh, open the ritual up, the sickle was, was gone. And I think I, that, that was one thing that was very disappointing to me. But then again, I kind of expected it because the person that had the house, I knew them. And 99.9% .9 of the people that were in circle in the ritual, I knew as well. But there were several people that looked like they just weren't really interested or they were just, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you know, watchers. All they wanted to do was watch and, you know, just kind of giggle and do whatever because they thought it was funny that the pagans were doing a pagan thing and whatever. And I think it was possibly one of them. And I haven't found um, a good sickle to replace it. A sickle for your altar um, as a druid, I think, is important. Uh, the next best thing that you can get that will, would uh, uh, replace a sickle which we'll talk about the significance of the sickle and some other druid things here in just a minute. But um, a, another good replacement is a bowling. And bowling is basically a uh, curved ritual blade that is used for harvesting herbs. They're about so big, you know, 8 to 10 inches long, maybe a little bit shorter, with a white handle and then a curved blade. And you just use it to... Uh, go into your herb garden, you make a blessing to the gods and ask for the, the, you know, take some of the herb off. And then a lot of people will leave pennies, um, stones, and things in the garden as they take these various things of the herbs. So that's something else uh, that would be uh, a good uh, replacement. And another thing is, here's, here's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. There are big, big differences in how druids do ritual compared to Wicca. And one of the things is, necessarily, we don't, as druids, we don't necessarily need an athame to, uh, to cast a circle because we don't cast, we don't cast circles in the traditional sense. And the other thing is, for certain things, we don't need wands. Now, there is a hazel wand that is used for certain things, but as far as always needing to have a wand, um, you don't necessarily have to have a wand. Um, but some of the things that I recommend, uh, the standard stuff is you're going to need uh, uh, some kind of chalice or glass that you can put ritual beverages in. Um, also, uh, some kind of container uh, or dish that you can have uh, offerings of various ritual foods and things like that. Have something that you can have specially set aside to use on your altar like that. And then also some kind of vessel or uh, thing that you can use to burn incense. Whether you burn cones or sticks or if you have the charcoal, the little round charcoal briquettes that you put the um, powder and resin incenses in. Well, you're going to need something to put that in and, and do the burning. And also, I recommend tongs to move that around in and stuff. So you're going to need a bunch of general little things to uh, make uh, the altar a little bit more friendly and accessible whenever you're doing a ritual. And the other thing that's druidic that I highly recommend, and it uh, was shown in the video where we did the solitary ritual, is a uh, bell branch and a bell branch is a uh, apple branch that has been um, uh, specially prepared with bells on it which mine is and it's painted silver and wrapped with a white handle a uh, white ribbon around the handle and that is used for various uh, processes and things during ritual that's something that I recommend that you make that you find uh, and there's there's various and many um, representations of what a bell branch can look like. So it doesn't always have to, they don't always have to look the same, but it is something that you can consider uh, making for your altar. Um, let's see, also another thing that I would have handy at all times um, is some kind of snuffer for your candles. One of the things is whenever I use candles, I don't blow them out 
because whenever you blow them out, you're using the breath of life, which comes from you, to snuff out the flame, which flame is alive. So you basically you're not you don't want to use your breath to snuff out a living being, so or to 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 quench a living thing. So basically, the only alternative, the safe alternative, is to use a snuffer. Which I've got one that was given to me for Yule last year, a beautiful one from a member of the Order of the Standing Oak. Her name's Erin, and it's just beautiful. Um, that I've got that. And also, another thing that I recommend for people is um, we recognize the idea of the universe, uh, at least within my tr tradition, that the universe is a seamless cosmic egg. And for my altar, I have a honey crotal or a honey rhodolite um, egg, and this thing is heavy and it's beautiful. And I've had it for years, and it just has a wonderful, wonderful energy. So this is something that I have for my altar, and I would never not have it for my altar because it's just I've worked with it for so long that it's it's a part of me. It's a part of what I want. Um, holy crap! Just want to take a minute to say hello to everybody. We've got almost 300 people here tonight. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to, uh, uh, you know, hang with me as we do these classes and stuff. If, uh, you know, we're going to do this as long as we can, we'll do this all the way through this situation that we're going through. Um, if you guys can hear me okay and if you can understand what I'm talking about, go ahead and hit me with a thumbs up. And um, we'll talk about the next situation. So we've got everything that we want to have for our altar. We've got all the little bits and bobs and things like that. You can put stones on there, whatever, crystals, um, pieces of wood that are native to your home area or whatever. The sky's the limit. So you basically have your, uh, your ritual space set up. Um, for inside and one thing I will say is there are uh, a lot of differences depending on how you're working ritual in your house it's like this there will be rituals that will be one way inside and the ritual that exact same ritual won't be the same outside because then you can the because when you're outside you're not con you're not confined by space like here in my apartment, it's so small that there are certain ritual actions that we can't necessarily do. For like one thing, we can't drum. Two, we can't uh, do the, uh, uh, you know, letting people into the circle after going through a processional. Space is just too small. There's no room to do a processional here. So there's different things that, you know, that you're only going to be able to do, that you're only going to be able to do inside. You're going to have to, you know, just... Uh, you know, adjust it to your situation, you know, write the rituals and stuff to where you know that you can do these certain things indoors. And then whenever you go outdoors, you can do whatever you want, because like I say, you're not constrained by areas of space and things like that. So we have the Druid Outdoor Sacred Spaces, and they have many different names. Um, there are groves, which of course are groves of oak trees, and inside these groves of oak trees, whenever you see a druidic circle set up, that is called a nematon. And, uh, matter of fact, I'll have to see if I can repost it. It's way, 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 way down at the bottom of the druid school webpage, but Years ago, we used to have a very beautiful uh, nematon that was outside of town. It's actually about 12 miles outside of town. And it was on a property of some friends of ours that let us go in, drag all the old broken down trees and stuff, clean that out, and then we uh, lined it with stones and did other things to get it prepared. And we had a decent, beautiful working space for... Uh, you know doing things outdoors so um, and you can do that on your property you can do it in your backyard if you have acreage you can set up a space um, find a, a an open spot in a grove of trees 
or in a place that can be cleared out and you can clear it out and then what we did was we took and uh, took rakes and stuff like that and cleaned it out and then we started looking around the outer perimeter of some of these these tree lines and found stones of you know the size of a baseball to uh, basketball sized and bigger and kind of moved them around and made a circular space and um, it was very cool it was very cool I mean uh, you know we had many people we had good God I think we had like 10 or 12 people that came and helped to get everything set up and do the work and whatever and I don't I have video of the aftermath but somebody else has video of the actual working working that day so I'm gonna see if I can get that footage from them and I'll put it up on the Missouri Druid School page so that you guys can see what it's like to get out and really get in there and make your uh, space your own so the only thing that we did not have is the altar and the altar you can we bring we would bring an altar in but the stones that we had there weren't big enough to um, you know to set one up there right off and what we were going to do is we were going to get a slab of some kind of you know shale stone or something something that was sturdy enough to do the job um, that we could set up and then take down at a moment's notice we would just like uh, we had some tree stumps that had been cut and they were both basically a, a safe enough height to be off the ground and we would just have set that slab across the top of it but a lot of the quarries and things around here for a three foot slab that was like three foot by two and a half three foot long by two and a half feet wide and by like three or four inches thick they were wanting like three hundred dollars because they thought we were like gonna do a countertop or something like that no 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 we weren't that's not what we were doing but around here because everybody is so so many nice houses and so many rich parts of town that you can't get super super cheap uh, slab rock like that every slab that has been cut or, or stacked in any of these quarry selling places they're not cheap you're not gonna find anything under two hundred dollars so at that time it's just we winged it we did other things to uh, you know uh, accommodate our altar now indoors or outdoors when you're new to this there's some things that you need to do one thing is consecrate your space Whenever you very first set it up, this is your time to say that I'm following the gods. This is what I'm doing. So you can take, uh, make up some of your own blessed water. And you can take a branch of a tree and dip that water, dip it into the water. And, you know, uh, do th a passes of three where you asperge the area. And you want to make that that magically ready as possible you do the same thing with the items that you are using to do for your altar um, anything that's very important or specific to your grove or your order or whatever if you don't necessarily want to leave it out on the altar all the time then I highly recommend that whenever you take down your ritual area at the end of a at the end of a meeting is to place it in some kind of receptacle that uh, is only for that so in other words if you have um, a box that will hold your bell branch make sure that you put it in there um, if you have uh, a place to put your altar statues take in some white linen and bind them with a green cord and then place them inside of another box so that they can be kept safe and unbroken and things like that but everything that you use um, from your candles to your bell branch each one of those things should be consecrated in your manner whatever it is uh, some people will take the sickle and they will bury it in the earth during a sun cycle where it is sunny uh, like uh, you know like if you're on a sun cycle where it is high all the time and stuff like that you'll put it in at you'll bury it at sun up or at sun when you get up in the morning just before sunrise you'll bury it in the dirt and then you'll take it out of the earth at um, 
sundown and then you will place it in a cloth of either green or white and tie it with a ribbon or tie it with a cord and then put it away and do that for you know the different things that you deem you know the most important you don't necessarily have to be ginger with everything because you're going to have some stuff that is going to be used ruggedly it's going to get a lot of use and things like that like your sensor and some of the other things but you still want to you also still want to at least give it a general uh, uh, what do you call it um, going over with some water and stuff like that to, to bless it and make it useful for what you want to do now the one thing if you are in a grove or an order and you do have a sacred space one of the first things that I recommend that you do is get the people together and whoever is in the uh, position of leading the ritual for your group for a, a certain day get together and bless the space where you are setting up your nematon um, you walk around the perimeter you bless your altar if you have a permanent altar set up uh, you bless the spirits of nature and place and the ancestors that are there because what you're doing is you're saying to the gods and to the the, the beings that are in that location that this is where you want to work and to have the best outcomes that you can for everything that you do with your group um, you want to start things out on a good footing you know you want to have uh, as good of a uh, reception from the spirits of place and nature there as possible I've known people that have done shoddy work uh, you know setting up their nematons and spaces and things like that and they think well I don't really need to do any of this stuff and when they neglect to establish a relationship with the beings that are in that area some things have happened I mean I've known people that have gotten sick because that they didn't do things that they could have done to make things a little bit better um, I know one uh, group in another part of the state that set up a nematon that they just kind of winged it and just went on their merry way and didn't really, you know, take to heart what they could have done. And their nematon caught on fire. And it, they ended up having the county to come out to put out a fire that burned like seven acres, I think seven or eight acres and stuff like that. So it's like you want to be respectful of the space that you're that you're working in it's not you know it's not a little fun time it's not a little fun place this is something where you're working ritual for your spiritual enlightenment for your path and for your your tribe and your people so you want to do things in as respectful a manner as possible okay so that's why you know we do things like with the sickle and also if you can get it um, for like Yule if you can get you some mistletoe have that for your altar the other thing is that there are rituals and this is for people that are a little bit more advanced and have worked within druidry for a while there's also something called um, a homeopathic mistletoe what it is is it's a tincture that is food grade you don't want anything else but food grade because if you get real mistletoe that is not food grade and you try to imbibe it, it will kill you. It is poisonous. But if you get food grade, then it will, um, you won't have that. And whenever you do use a food grade mistletoe in either a glass of wine or mead or some other potion that you're making to, uh, you know, enlighten members of your gro grove or specifically for bards that are going on vision quests, you know, that, uh, uh, they will sit at a, at a fire at sundown and they will watch that fire all night and they'll scry and in certain traditions there is a tincture that can be drank with meat or another beverage that will help with their you know the things that they can see it's like raising it says a witch will do the things that they need to do to raise the kundalini that I mean one of them is incense wine and other things well this is something else so but when I say this, this is something that you need to research and, you know, figure out for yourself because you don't, not everybody wants to do it. But for those that are, um, that are studied enough to be able to figure this out, there are places that, uh, 
Druidic websites that talk about mistletoe, the uses of mistletoe, and how the um, homeopathic mistletoe can be used in ritual. Um, the same way that there are people that use cannabis in ritual, there are other people that can that are uh, adept at, enough that they can use uh, hallucinogenic certain hallucinogenics in ritual. But the other thing is like if you have no tolerance for any of those kind of substances and you're working in a sacred space whether it's at your own altar or out in a nematon don't do it if, if you have even the slightest little bit of intolerance to it whether it makes you sick or you just overindulge or you just you know whatever the thing is if you don't physically think and mentally believe that it is something that you can handle other than maybe a, a sip of meat or wine, you know, at various points in the ritual, then don't do it. I want everybody to be safe, and I want your rituals to be effective because whenever you do something that you don't necessarily feel is, you know, um, uh, you know that that is right for you, you're kind of going against the gist of the ritual. I've known people that where we've had eight or ten or twelve or fifteen or however many people in circle. And these are people that have worked together in the past. And it's like, then you get one or two new folks that come in and they're trying to learn what you're doing. So they learn by imitation. So they're going to do the same things that you're doing, uh, every ritual action, every chant, whatever. And if there is some kind of beverage that is going around that has these things in it, regardless of the fact that the people that have been there before understand and know what know what to expect with it, these new folks that don't know their ass from apple butter are going to be in a position where they're going to try to mimic and do what the rest of the group is doing, and that can be dangerous. So I always say work with caution. Work safe and work healthy because then at the end of the day, whenever you do your ritual and things like that, um, it'll be more effective. As an example, whenever you're doing outside ritual and a, limp, and a nematon, other than the idea that you have, like say that you build a nematon and you have placed stones around, one thing, stones are part of the earth, so though they are very conducive of ritual energy. But here's the thing, the difference, one of the main differences between Druidic ritual and Wicca is Wicca tends to be one of the deals where you cast a circle and you do that so that you can contain energy that is raised in circle to be sent to a specific purpose. Okay, the cone of power, we know about that. On the other side of it, Druids, we believe every space and place on this planet are sacred. So we might join hands and chant the awe wind to kind of bring everything together, our own energies into sync, but we're not necessarily casting sacred space. There are times that people do that for various rituals, like if you're doing the tarp face or you're doing other little bit more intense types of workings, then mostly the times that those are being done whenever a ritual area is being delineated and cast, you're doing that as a, as a way of protection. Like if you've heard of the circle of white light that will protect you from this and that when you're doing a more heavy working, that's like putting up the circle of protection in that way. But in Druidry, we don't necessarily have to. There are traditions that have their ways of doing it, but in general, we don't have to. Um, that's another thing is like we that's where one of the things of, that we do use the uh, sickle for is to cast those. Um, some other items that are usable in your, uh, other than the things that you're going to necessarily put on your altar uh, in an outdoor setting, you can put all the exact same things on an indoor altar as you would on an outdoor, outdoor altar. But, <coughs> excuse me, there are some more things that can be added and let me get a drink here real quick holy cow we've got 440 people and it's so cool I'm glad you guys are here give me just a second folks so you have everybody in your circle and you have the altar so we've got that set up you have the people and you have the altar set up but there are other things 
that can uh, be um, added to the efficiency of what your altar is doing and to what the ritual is, is, is achieving by adding elements such as a bale fire, which that's another thing is if you are setting up a bale fire in your nematon, you've got to be very careful about making sure that you have everything safe um, and that if you can to have some water nearby so and, and dirt and things like that set up so that if things start to get out of hand you can douse it really quick and make sure that fire doesn't spread you want to build a little fire pit uh, out in front of your altar if you can to uh, you know set the bale fire in you've got that set up and then some groves will also add not just having the bale fire but they will also have um, their own cauldron and cauldrons are important in both traditions Wicca and Druidry um, you know they're pretty much the same thing the cauldron represents the universe and uh, the, the aspects of life uh, fertility things like that so cauldrons are important for us too um, and you can find cauldrons anywhere and everywhere uh, if you know people that are metalsmiths you can get some re you can request and you know pay a good little penny for some of them but you're gonna have a beautiful ritual item that will last long after you're gone so that and then there are places online that you can order pre-made tripod like three-legged kettle cauldrons of various sizes anywhere from 125 bucks up to a thousand dollars it just depends on what you and your group wants to do so you've got those things and then there's items that are a little bit more representative to druidry one thing um, we have something called the bile which is b-i-l-e which is a representation of the axis mundi the straight up and down vertical line that goes through the earth that separates it's the center of the universe they say something is the center of the universe the axis mundi is the center of the universe and the billet is the irish version of the axis mundi and one of the things that you can do is you can take an eight foot tall rod or some people have a ten foot tall rod and have it staked into the ground and have that set in the middle of your nematon and use that as your representation of the Axis Monday and there are various things you can do ritually for that also there is a tradition um, in Druidry that takes the Axis Monday and they will take that uh, rod and they will paint it in concentric circles all the way around it all the different colors of the spectrum from the lightest to the darkest starting at the top and working to the bottom and the width uh, of the rings are different because you have to figure how many different uh, spectrum parts there are from the lightest to the darkest and then you find those colors of paint which you can find that at just about any hobby shop or whatever um, or art store or things like that and you paint that and then you shellac it up and that becomes something that is a permanent part of your uh, ritual worship space um, also there are larger versions of like the 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 uh, statue that I just showed just a minute ago of Danu she's a little nine inch tall version there are places that if if I can still find them I'd have to put some links I'm gonna put some links and things out uh, after we get done with this class tonight so that you guys can find some of the things that I'm talking about and kind of get started on your altars if you haven't already got one um, but there are larger versions that you can take that are weather resistant and hard to get blown over and stuff they're weighted and you can put them in your nematon and have them used as uh, representations of the gods and the nature spirits in your nematon your nematon can be um, as large or as small as you want for a single person to stand and do ritual by themselves or for groups of 20 30 40 50 people depending on your space as a matter of fact on Missouri Druid School, we have some people that have recently uh, joined the uh, uh, page that have video of their ritual circles. And we have Annette Archibald um, that lives in Colorado, and their entire backyard is their uh, ritual circle. 
and it's got stones and it's got altars and it's beautiful so I recommend that you scroll down through uh, the posts that are on the Missouri Do It School page and you'll see her and her husband working uh, matter of fact I think she posted the video just a few days ago as a matter of fact of them working on their nematon it's beautiful and speaking of which for those of you that are out there if you have I tell you what if you have an altar already set up if you already have a nematon set up I recommend and, and can challenge you to uh, come to Missouri Druid School the page here on Facebook and show us your nematon show us your altars and stuff like that because it's cool to see how people do their sacred space and different things and also how they have their nematon set because I know that many of you that are watching right now are you know you might have a couple of friends that you work with or you may be solitary or you may be part of an actual druid order that has their own you know dedicated sacred space so you have that also as well now before we kind of uh, wrap this up just a little bit holy crap we're at 500 people good to see you guys hope you guys are having a great week hope everybody's safe um got more people coming in as we speak one of the things that we also need to look into is everybody's asking well why are druids the way they look in all the pictures and everything like that so one of the things that we always get uh, other than the fact that everybody asks, can women be druids? Of course, women can be druids. Anybody can can practice a, a spiritual tradition. It doesn't. It's it's sexless. You don't have to be any gender specific to practice a pagan tradition. It's just if somebody tells you that 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 you have to be a certain way in this or that, they're full of shit. Don't listen to what they're saying because they're wrong. It's just they're incorrect. But the, you, there's always this classic visage and view of what a druid is which is a, a old man with long white hair and a white beard down to his knees and a white robe and carrying a sickle of course um, and you know there it grows the trees okay there are uh, orders that are like that there are British druid orders there is uh, the AODA um, there is ADF and stuff like that that there are druids in white robes um, I'm a druid that wears a white robe, but on the other side of that, back in the beginning times, not all druids wore white robes. There were druids that wore speckled raiment. Speckled raiment as in they would wear their, their normal clothes, but the things that kind of delineated them as being druids is that they made special cloaks and shoulder coverings that were made out of bird feathers. So you have those speckled raiments that were the, the, the feathers and these things that were put together, skins and hides off of various animals, fox and bear and whatever, because it would, you know, having these various items, the feathers and the skins and these things, being animus, because we are animus, we see the natural world and the animals, uh, uh, spirits that are a part of it, as something that is effective in how we as druids work with the natural world the world that we're in right now so it was more than just the idea of you know that they wore a white robe to um, you know show that they were druids also um, just, just just bringing it to a modern um, uh, realm for a minute a lot of the the, the orders are uh, like I said druidry is a initiatory tradition okay more so than a lot of others a lot of the other traditions that have initiations have borrowed practices from ancient Celtic Druidry, such as the year and a day concept. Well, the other things that we have that we brought into the modern world is, okay, we have the delineations of Druid, Bard, and Ovate Seers. Okay, so for the most part, a, uh, a lot of Druid orders will have, uh, as an example, Everybody will wear white, white robes, but they may have a cord that they wear around their waist that uh, separates them from uh, the others, like, you know, um, this type of bard over here and this type of seer over there. Okay, within my tradition, here's how it works. Within the Order of Standing Oak, those that do druid ritual and lead 
uh, ritual practice and stuff for people and groves and things like that, we have a series of initiations before you are, you know, at the at the highest level that you can initiate into, and a druid that is leading ritual wears white robes, and over time their cords change. They start with one color of of cord, and then they end up whenever they reach their final destination within that grade, they are, you know, uh, uh, preferred or given by me a very uh, a variant of the very first uh, chord that they started with. Okay, so that's the white robe and you have the chords. And then you look at the uh, uh, bards. Bards within our order wear blue robes. And the blue robes are uh, delineated by various colors of chords as well. Okay, so they will always have blue robes throughout their entire time is that, that they work with the Order of the Standing Oak and as they progress within their studies over time and over the years they won't have the very first uh, chord that they started with they'll move on to another chord and then when they reach the, the final tier of that they'll have a chord that I will prefer upon them or others that are within the Order will prefer upon them to be one of their last and then we have the Ovate Seers the ones that work uh, uh, working with the future, herbalism, healing, and such. And the Ovate Seers, the healers, and the herbalists, and all of those things that are within the order, they wear green robes. And the green robes is the same way you start with one cord color, and then you work your way all the way through um, till you come to that last one. And it's basically like I said before in the why, the reason why things in Druidry are initiatory is because um, one of the one of the groups that we have in the United States is ADF and they have what's a, a motto called Why Not Excellence. And one of the reasons why their motto is Why Not Excellence is because there's a lot of magical traditions where people can just pop up, show up for ritual, come to a few rituals. And say that they know everything, they've done everything, and they're a grand poobah high mucky muck priest and whatever. When you have a tradition that asks you to study and perform various tasks to move forward from one point to another, which is what initiation is, going from point A to point B in your spiritual path and your connection and commitment to the gods and various other things. So what this is doing is it's signposts. Whenever you start with your first chord and your very first row, that's the first signpost that you're at. And you're moving forward and you're studying and you're learning. And these things are going on. So then you'll reach your next point and you'll get that next chord. And then you'll go through that and you'll be initiated into the next grade, the next part of that grade. And then eventually over the years and stuff, whenever you've just you've gone and you've been so instrumental in things within the Order of Standing Oak and you're teaching and you're helping to start other groves and think that you will be preferred a final uh, chord and that's the one where it says that within this order we appreciate you so much that you're an elder you're somebody that is one that is a backbone and a bulwark of this tradition and that's why ADF has their motto, Why Not Excellence? Because all good things come to people, come to those who are not afraid to work for it. If you just want to come in and go to ritual and watch and then think over after coming for a year that you know everything and stuff, and then when somebody puts you to the test and you can't even, you know, there's times whenever somebody is trying to work a ritual that if you're there, and you know that something's going on, if you can understand and uh, if you can kind of like sense that they're on the right track, whenever you know somebody's doing something when they're doing it right, ritual will, it would just, there's a feel. If, you could, if you've ever felt energy during ritual when it was correct and flowing and working and things are just moving and you know the gods are in it and this is what's going on, and it's great it's because the person that's presenting the ritual that is working it with you has studied 
and put everything together to make sure it's at the right time and this and that and the other thing because the steps about how you get ready to do it and work it with your friends and your loved ones in, 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 the, in the ritual space itself is very important. But if you're not willing to take the time to learn how to do these things, then how can you say, you know, that you are uh, able to do it? As an example, there was a time where we were uh, in the coven that I originally started with, and we were starting to get big. Lots of people were coming to ritual. People I never knew. This was after my first initiation. Um, and we had young kids. Young kids, 18, because we couldn't really have anybody under 18. That's another thing within our order. We won't uh, teach anybody the order's workings under the age of 18 simply because of the fact that we're in the state of Missouri and we're a Republican-run state. So there's a lot of, of uh, litigiousness here because paganism isn't really liked. I mean, we're tolerated. We've been tolerated for years. But if they want to come at us for one reason or another, they will come at us. It just it just depends. So you've got to be safe on how you go about teaching and allowing people to work with you. Letting somebody in for ritual just to uh, attend a Sabbath or just a celebratory thing, that's great. No problem, you know, unless their parents freak out, you know, if they're under 18. And that's a whole different thing. So it's kind of still a good idea to make sure that they at least have parents' permission and all these other things. Because if the, if you don't, you're going to have a whole lot of stuff to have to deal with. So we were starting to have these things come up where we're having more and more people uh, show up. And the coven that I was with where you did you could come to ritual and learn things. But over time, it did get to the point where... Uh, you know that there were people that were actually wanting to study so there was teaching going on there was classes and various things and we had some of these kids are 18 19 20 23 whatever that were coming and some of them were coming and you know going to class for a day or two and others that were trying to you know do it longer they were making you know they were actually making strides to do it well over time you know you've got some of these kids that were coming to ritual and they were asking our high priestess, well, when can I initiate? And now, initiation into the coven, that's up to the high priestess and the high priest. And, and you, too, you're, you're in, that, in that equation as well. But the thing about it is, is before you're even considered for initiation in the coven that I was at, the coven has to know you. We have to know how you work in circle and all these other little parameters and stuff. Because we're just not, it's just like you just don't come in day one, say, hi, initiate me. It don't work like that. We just, the group that I was with and a lot of groups that I know aren't going to initiate somebody on day one. So we had a situation that was, uh, it was in the summer. It was before Samhain. And so we were having rituals and doing drummings and things like that. And one night we had a fairly large ritual in our high priestess's backyard everything was going great and everything and you know whatever and this one kid had been bugging our high priestess for weeks and weeks well at this at the ritual that we were at that night he wanted to be initiated into the coven and the high priest and the high priestess said no you're we're not going to do it you may think you're ready but you've only been coming for like two or three months at the most and you know we're still getting to know you and and us and we've got other people that we are dealing with here that are new we're trying to deal with a growing situation right now so before we initiate anybody we've got to see things see how things adjust well this kid uh couldn't handle that fact so we're there standing in circle we finish drumming they're getting ready to uh uh do this you know, uh, ritual and whatever. And this kid kind of come up into the middle of the circle over by where the altar was. He goes, hey, everybody, not only are we doing this tonight, but we're also going to do uh, uh, my initiation. Well, the one thing about initiation, the only people that are allowed to be at your initiation are people that are initiated. And there were a bunch of people that were in this ritual circle that were not a part of the of the coven, so they were not privy to 
uh, initiation ceremonies are private. This is something that you don't do in public. Now, dedications to the craft or dedications to Druidry and to starting learning and stuff like that, some of those things, depending on your tradition, can be allowed to have uh, Cowan people. Cowans are people that are un, unwitchified, you know, just basically new to it. So these people, some of these people can be allowed to be in circle whenever you're going through your beginning of, you know, wanting to dedicate to the gods and stuff like that. But as far as full-blown initiatory traditional ritual, we don't do that. We don't allow outsiders that have never uh, studied or are just like they're just here to just check things out just because of the laws of, of secrecy and, and magical tradition and things like that. You don't let that to happen so this kid he's up there he's trying to get this thing to go on and the high priest just straight up just said so-and-so's name she goes dude tonight's not the night well he got all pissy and upset and he uh, slapped her athame off the altar onto the ground and he he left off and he was just like okay fuck you guys whatever he's cussing at us and everything and he goes you know what? You guys are fake anyway. Um, I'm going to go and get initiated by the Druids. And also around this time was when I was starting to study Druidry as well. And all I'm thinking in my mind is I'm laughing. This kid doesn't understand what Druidry is in the, in the vein of being an initiatory tradition. So it's like going from the frying pan into the fire. Well... Uh, what happened was that kid left. Uh, he never came back around, never came to any meetings or anything that I was aware of. But eventually, uh, him and his wife got in a fight. His kids got taken away from him, and he left the state, and he got arrested in Arizona or something like that. So long story short, it's like, uh, you know, what you expect, uh, you know, to get, you're not going to get it. And the people that are dedicated to their to their spirituality, those are the ones that are going to ensure that their spirit goes on in a good way. So whenever you're involved in the ADF or you're involved in the White Oak branch of Druidry or Obod or whatever, they're not asking you to study for your initiations to be assholes about things. There's a reason behind it. They want to know and they want to make sure that you are adept and willing to work and to learn and like I said those signposts are going to come up and at the end of it you will you will make it there are people that I know that are going through OBOD classes right now that are you know really working at it and they're learning the bardic craft they're learning the ovate seers craft they're doing this there are people I know in the AODA and the RDNA and all these various different druid orders and stuff and, and things around the United States that they're putting the effort and the work in so you know that they that they can do it and some other things you know they talk about well you know uh, the clothes you know their white robes long white hair beards and stuff the other thing that uh, is a, a spiritual component for druids um, in a lot of traditions is something called the cream bag and the crane bag is called the bag of secrets. What the crane bag is a bag of secrets is, is what you place in it is something that's so sacred to you that you will only pull it out for various rituals and things like that. Um, and there are, good God, there are so many uh, examples of that you can see online. But this one was made for me by a guy that was a druidic shaman. He was kind of on both sides there. And we'll talk about druidic shamanry in another class. But he was beautiful with uh, working with leather. So, I can get this thing to pick up. Which I need to figure out a way to do it. But, this right here, uh, the the fringes have since long since uh, crinkled up. But this is my crane bag. It is white leather with uh, fringes up here in the top. And the closure, if I can get this to kind of, that button right there, that is, that is part of a deer horn. 
And inside of my crane bag, I have some items in here that I only pull out for various special certain rituals. And you can make these for yourself. Easy to stitch it together. Run your cord, your ritual cords through it. And then strap it around your waist whenever you wear your altar. Or excuse me, when you wear your uh, robes or other uh, ritual garments. And other things, you don't necessarily have to wear robes, uh, men or women. You can wear Celtic garb, such as uh, kilts and things like that, or women can wear beautiful dresses and things like that. Um, it's, you know, depending on your tradition or how you work. Um, and also, within Druidry, with certain uh, rituals like the tarp face, of course, we would work nude. Now, the, that's another difference is we don't necessarily, uh, within Druidic ritual, uh, go for the everybody in ritual as skyclad thing, but there are certain various rituals that people don't, that the general public does not know about, where most people within the ritual space can be uh, skyclad. But for the most part, where you're going to see skyclad is Alexandrian craft, Gardnerian craft, and various forms of Dianic and Radical Fairy uh, rituals that people will be fully sky clad so you have the you have the crane bag you have the robes you have these other things you have the altars and stuff and basically this is where we start this is how it all begins and then we move forward we go forward in our studies and learning and our altars will change our robes and, and accoutrement the things that we cover ourselves those will change those will change over time because we're different. Um, another thing that we'll kind of end this with is the idea of I am Tim, but I am also Reverend Sylvanus Treewalker of the Order of Standing Oak. And they go, well, how do you have two names? Okay, everybody, here's the deal where we talk about ritual and spiritual names. The reason why, a lot, and some people don't understand this, so that's why we're going to talk about this for a minute, is our names that we have that are our birth names that were given to us, that is a name for the mundane world. We go to work, we go take our kids to school, we do all these different things. So I'm Tim, you're Suzanne, or Mark, or David, or Leon, or whatever. That's you. That's your identity in this paycheck, everyday world. But... We also have to look at what it is that we're doing whenever we work magic or we do meditation or all these different things that are in a pagan wheelhouse or are in our druidic wheelhouse. We are the same person, but whenever we doing whenever we're doing these things, there are subtle changes that are happening psychically, physically, spiritually. Um, connections are being made and stuff like that so whenever we are working magic and doing these things we're not Suzanne we're not Bob we're not whoever we're somebody else so the question is well if we're not Bob Suzanne Leon or whatever then who are we that's where the ritual names come in and the idea of the ritual name is something that will delineate you from who you are in the paycheck world and who you are whenever you're standing before the gods and uh, you know doing what you do and so you could be uh, my name is uh, Melvana uh, Oakstaff or for a woman or my name is Brian Stoutarm for uh, you know a, a male all these different things because it, it's it's up to you. It can be an animal's name, like I am fox, I am badger, I am all these different things. Uh, you know, different names can be for what you want to, you know, uh, name yourself. And the reason why that you do that is also there's in speech whenever we talk, there are vibrations that come out. When I'm talking to you now, the air is moving and vibrating and causing sound. So whenever you work ritual and magic and meditate. And do these other things whenever you are saying your name like I reverence Sylvanus Tree Walker of the Order of Standing Oak call forth the gods tonight to do this that and the other thing 
you keep doing that over and over and over again over time by announcing who you are and what that's doing is setting up a conduit for the guys to go oh I know him I know what he's doing I know why he's here I understand the situation that he's he's talking about and stuff like that um, and it's it's basically a setting apart of who you are from the mundane world to the magical now on both sides of the flip coin of that you don't have to have a magical name you can come to the gods and go I am Kathy I am Jim here's what I want to talk to you about and whatever but so many pagans do have rituals and, and, and pagan names because it is something that allows us to think different to process things different whenever we do it whenever we do the things that we do whether it's meditation or lighting candles or whatever so that's another thing is um, I would say if you would like to get a hold of me at, on here on Facebook at um, Missouri Druid School and just leave a little thing on the, in the in the group and tell me what is your uh, 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 pagan name now here's another thing about that a lot of people go well I'm afraid to tell you my pagan name and there's a reason for some of that but here's how you get around it okay it is said that like in various uh, Christian traditions and certain pagan traditions that to know someone's name true name is to t be able to take their power to take their essence now when it comes to a pagan name here's how you get around that you can have two different pagan names one that you use for whenever you're around people and a true name that you keep to yourself and you tell no one the only time that that name is used is between you and the gods or whatever it is you're doing um, and even if you're a leader of a ritual and stuff where there's other people around I would use the the pagan name that you use while you're around for being around other people and never ever use your the name that you choose to be your true name and if somebody asks you don't tell them if they try to guess it that whole nine yards keep that to yourself and there are uh, books that are out there that can kind of help you uh, pick names but it can be you can be petunia you can be anything that you want that resonates with your with your heart the other thing is a lot of people go well do I have to keep that name forever no over time I've gone through seven my very first initiatory name when I was initiated into my coven was Nova Star Dancer okay because I was really big into like spiritual magic uh, I'm still into ceremonial magic today I'm a druid I'm a witch and I also do Western ceremonial magic OTO AA things like that so I have several different magical names but I'm still Tim I'm still the same guy that has that name that you see on the screen for uh, you know Facebook purposes and stuff but when it's time to be magical and to go into that world I have other names too and I'm sure you do too I know there's a lot of you out there that have you know various and sundry different magical names so you know I'm not asking you to tell me your name so that I can take your power to see if you have a name that you use a craft or, uh, craft or a druidic name that you use for when you're with people I'd love to know what it is because I've seen some really cool ones that I go oh my god you know because people are creative and they come up with ideas that you would never think of so everybody that's out there right now um, if you haven't uh, been by then I recommend that you come to uh, Missouri Druid School click the group thing for that and I will add you and we've got people coming in all the time um, and we're uh, you know we're pretty much done with this class but I've got some uh, news for you okay the next thing that we're getting ready to do is Beltane so what we've been doing here recently is I've been holding classes on Thursdays and I've been doing something on Sunday nights um, and you know so we've done uh, rituals and, and all these different things because of the fact that Beltane is coming up next week what we're gonna do is this Sunday 
we're not doing anything. This coming Thursday, we're not doing anything because what I'm going to be doing is I'm preparing for Beltane. And what that is, is what we're doing is here in Springfield for the last four years, the Order of Standing Oak has been in various parks and, and other recreational uh, areas that we have available to us. And we've done something called Beltane in the Park. Our very first Beltane in the Park, we had about 100 people. Um, and we've had on average of 70 and 80. And it's just been beautiful kids and potluck food and drumming and ritual. And we've got pictures of some of those, those celebrations and stuff. But because of the fact that this uh, virus has, has basically put everybody on the inside of their houses, not everybody has the chance to go out and you know do Beltane. Some people are in apartments. Some people don't have access to an area where they could go do ritual. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to take that Beltane in the Park and make it Beltane on Facebook. Beltane in the Park 2020 on Facebook. And what that's going to in include is on Saturday, May 2nd, between 5 and 6 p.m. Just depends on, you know, whenever I can get everything together because I'll have to set up the altar and get the, get the ritual put up on its planchard and everything like that. And what we'll do is I will go live and we'll sit here and we'll bullshit and we'll eat and we'll have our own little potluck. And then at the end of that portion of the evening, then we'll go into ritual. And what we're going to do for the ritual um, is I'm going to have a way where you can participate uh, without, you know, having to do anything with, you know, your cams or anything, but just ways that you can do response and things like that during the ritual. And it's the, these last few years, we've done a lot of ritual where it has been geared towards us, geared towards the gods, geared towards the ancestors, even at Beltane, because there are things that the ancestors are important for at Beltane, even though we consider it a, a fertility thing. But we've also got to look at the idea of the fae, the fairies, and how they uh, interact within uh, Irish lore and how they interact in Beltane. So this year, what we're going to do is we're going to be having a ritual called Fairies at Twilight. Ritual will be held at twilight, which will probably be about 7.15, 7.20-ish. Uh, ritual will be about 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. And the altar is going to be beautiful. It's going to be great. And uh, I've got some surprises for the altar and everything. You guys will get to see it. And this is, you know, I'm extending this as a way of people that just necessarily don't have anybody to do Beltane with. Or, you know, this, you know, being inside and you don't, through whatever means, have a way to do Beltane. That's going to be us. Beltane online. We can do it. I know that you can. Um, and I'm inviting all of you, all 775 of you that are, that are here with me tonight, are all invited to Beltane on Facebook, May 2nd, between 5 and 6 p.m., and we'll go live then. Also, um, if you have questions and, about anything we talked about, uh, altars, things that we talked about putting on altars um, and, and sacred spaces and things like that, uh, you can friend me here on Facebook and send me a message and I'll do my best to answer a question. If you ever have things that just kind of bug you and you want to learn maybe how to write a ritual or whatever, just all these different things. As a priest, I believe it's my job to not just, you know, do the things I'm doing now, but to help you in like as much of a pastoral mode as I can. So by doing that, I want to put the invite for anybody, man, woman, whatever, if you have any questions, if you just feel a little bit out of whack about life, you know, and you want to, uh, you know, ask me how to set up a meditation that would help you feel a little bit better, I can do that too. You know, it's like we help each other get through these things, you know, and I, I know we're going to get through this. I believe all of us that are here tonight um, on this are going to be all right. We're going to get through this. I know you guys are. We're pagans. We're strong, you know. Um, and it's like another thing is uh, what I'm going to do is as soon as we get done here with this, I'm going to go ahead and process this video footage that's going out to you now. And I will put it on my Facebook or on my YouTube channel. And my YouTube channel is A Pagan Perspective 
all one word with a capital A. And um, I invite you to come check out the videos that are on that. I've got videos from way back. All different kinds of uh, pagan and druidic uh, content are on um, that. And so it's like we're going to go through this. But yeah, so this next week we're going to have a little bit of a break. We're going to get ready for Beltane. And what I'm going to do is in the various druid groups and things that I'm posting this to now, we'll put uh, information and uh, updates about uh, the time and stuff for Beltane on May 2nd. And I hope to see you there. I mean, I hope it's going to be a fun time. Beltane is one of my favorite rituals. And even though we can't, you know, uh, necessarily go out and do the things that we want to do because of this situation we can still get together as pagans and you know enjoy the the season of fertility with the gods and our families and our kids and all that stuff like we're supposed to so before I shut this down um, give me a thumbs up if you like the class tonight if you think that you've got some kind of uh, benefit out of learning about what it is about altars and, and the sacred spaces that you know make druids what they are um, and I appreciate you guys for being here this is just awesome and what we're gonna do to kind of uh, just leave this off on a good energy note is what I want to do is we're gonna kind of sit back close your eyes and we're gonna inhale deep three times and as we do we're gonna exhale and we're gonna chant the all wind together Holding your breath, closing your eyes. Uh, May the peace of the gods be yours. I hope that you guys have a good week. Be safe. You know, be careful out there. Love on your kids. Hug your pets. Um, you know, just do the things that we do. Just keep going forward. We'll get through this in one pace, place. I know that we will. And we're going to keep going with this as much as we can because right after Beltane, we'll come back with more classes, more meditations, more learning. And, and it's something to do together. It's something that we can share you know in this situation and stuff and I appreciate every last one of you every 850 of you that are with me tonight that is so awesome that so many people are here with me tonight and just listening and, and you know enjoying a lesson about you know the things that druids are and what we do so having said that I'm gonna say have a good night and I'm gonna end this blessings of the old gods to all of you